So when it comes to sports science tracking technologies, we naturally think of GPS, but actually there are different types of tracking technologies available. So optical tracking, local positioning systems, and IMUs, for instance. So today we're gonna to dive into tracking technologies and discuss the differences between them, but then also the processes that you need to consider as a practitioner when it comes to data collection, data storage, and then data analysis to make sure you're getting the most out of your tracking technology to help you with external load monitoring. My name's Joe Clark. I'm an applied sports scientist. I now work as a consultant helping teams and practitioners all over the world with sports science and their tracking technologies. So the tracking technologies that we're going to talk about are used obviously to track our athletes, whether that is in the training um, environment or the competition arena. And we collect data on this movement to try to capture their external load so we can use it for load monitoring. Now, if you're not familiar with external load, perhaps take a look at my previous video where I talked about the differences between internal load and external load. And naturally, I think when we think of these kinds of technologies and, and training variables, we tend to talk about GPS, but actually there are a lot of different options for teams in terms of tracking technologies, and it's important that we understand the difference between them. So let's take a look at that first. Our first one here is available on Sports Performance and Science Reports website, and it's entitled Tracking Systems in Team Sports Back to Basic, co-authored between myself, Emma Beanland, and led by lead author Lorena Torres Ronda. So whilst we perhaps automatically talk about GPS, as I said, there are a few different options and I wanna scroll down here. We discussed the different types of tracking technologies available, most notably GPS, Global Positioning Systems, OT, Optical Tracking, LPS local positioning systems and IMU inertial measurement units and it's important to understand the differences between how these technologies capture data so that you can appreciate the pros and the cons for each option. So when it comes to GPS because the devices are communicating with the GPS systems the satellites in space um, the environmental conditions and also the physical conditions in terms of the stadia can affect the quality of data. So it's important to understand this, but also know where to look up metrics that relate to uh, satellite visibility, for instance. In another example, if we consider optical tracking, which are the camera-based systems that surround a playing arena, these work predominantly on X and Y, so it is just tracking position on the field or the, or the court. And it doesn't give any information about the, the Z axis, so the vertical plane. Compare that to IMUs where you're getting information of, through accelerometers through X, Y and Z. So whilst optical tracking can be beneficial because the athletes don't have to wear any devices physically, you're missing out on movements such as jumping and loads associated with that. So in a sport such as basketball, where there's a lot of vertical axis movement, although optical tracking is commonly utilized, this is disadvantaged by not capturing that information currently. So you can refer back to this table to get a understanding of the different types of tracking technologies. And now uh, we also then move on to talk about data processing. A lot of the time that is under the hood uh, work done by the company that we don't see, but there are important considerations for us to understand because they directly impact the outputs that we are dealing with. So in this figure, we are talking about threshold selection, which is a real challenge in sports science because 
across many sports, across the different sexes, there is no real consensus on the thresholds that should be applied. As, as we demonstrate in this figure, the thresholds that you select for your population can massively impact the outputs you get in terms of high speed running or the same discussion can be had in terms of acceleration and deceleration thresholds as well. Here I would suggest understanding the options, what is done elsewhere in the literature but also your population and what it means in your sport and your specific athletes in terms of their age and their sex as well. Now, as well as the thresholds themselves, we also want to understand the definitions behind effort detection. What actually defines a high speed running effort, for example, and try to highlight the differences that the settings can make in terms of whether a movement would be classified as a high speed running effort. And an important variable here is the dwell time or the minimum effort duration. And that is a time that you put it into the settings that determines how long they need to be above a certain threshold for it to be counted. So in the settings here, dwell time is set to 0.5. And we can see that this specific example, that the athlete has spent 0.4 seconds above the very high speed threshold. So actually, this would not count as a very high speed effort. It would count as just a high speed effort because they've been longer than that dwell time above this band, but not above this band. So now let's move on to the data collection. And it's really important. I cannot stress enough the importance as a practitioner of being consistent with how you approach this. It's not necessarily as easy as turning the devices on and turning them off. And so in this paper, we've provided a checklist of considerations for you, the practitioner, to make sure that you are always having a consistent, systematic process. So let's take a look at that checklist. So we talked about the system set up in terms of the settings, but we also want to understand what we need to do pre-session during the session and post session to make sure that we are collecting clean data that we can use for athlete load monitoring. So pre-session, whether it's tag or device, are they charged? Are they labeled for the right athlete? And are they assigned to the same athlete? Because studies have shown that there are differences in reliability between the units. And so if at all possible, Resources don't always allow, but as much as possible, it's better to use the same device for the same athlete. Frequently, players are either wearing those vests or perhaps they're wearing custom-made garments. We want to make sure that they are suitably sized because otherwise we're going to get noisy data. If the, if the garment is too big, we're going to get noisy data. In session, if you have the ability to use your tracking technology live that gives you an opportunity to verify that all the devices have switched on and are collecting data and then it's about managing both the practice or the training session as well as the specific drills and making sure the right players are in the right locations so ideally rehab players should be in their own whether it's uh, called a period or drill, whatever your technology uses. Again, this is going to enable our analysis to be accurate and to be relevant to what actually happened in the session. And I'm going to come on to, in a moment, examples of having session and drill um, categories or a typology that you use consistently that will help with your analysis as well. And then post-session, obviously, sports scientists task of collecting all the units in, often going through the laundry or the dirty washing to find that missing device, make sure it's downloaded correctly, checking for bad data, whether that is velocity spikes or data loss due to environmental conditions or players coming inside or anything like that. Personally, I like to map the raw velocity spike for all the players to really check that everything's come through and also 
in some softwares that enables you to see what drills they've been put into. And making sure that you're logging information relating to potential errors. So in this paper, we talk about signal strength and being able to track that so you get an idea of the quality of your data on that day. And then of course, making sure that that data is pulling through correctly and successfully into any reports or uh, athlete management systems that you might use. And in this part, we're talking about the benefits of having a real systematic categorization or naming process. It should be consistent because that will enable you, whether it is within the software itself or if you extract it and pull it out into Excel or Tableau or anything like this, you want to be able to filter by the day before the game, for instance, or by positions. Or perhaps you want to compare the intensity of all the different possession drills. Perhaps you want to look at how the intensity or the volume of, of the um, drill changes when the coach changes the size. These are all really insightful um, questions to answer for a coach. Being able to do that, you need to have the system set up that will enable you to automatically filter and extract the data that you want for analysis. So I would definitely encourage you to spend time crafting your session and drill level um, typologies. So in this video, we've walked through some of the key discussion points in this paper, tracking systems in team sports, back to basics, available open access in sports performance and science reports. Keep a lookout for my next video in which we'll be discussing the key talking points from this publication, also open access, in Sports Medicine Open, where we go into the various applications of tracking data and some sport specific considerations.